Welcome to Teachers Teaching Rules. Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is April 2nd, right? Yeah, 2014. And um, I was with Chris Sloan in Washington, D.C. recently at a writing project meeting. And he and I were thinking, um, we need to know what's going on with Monica Hardy a little more. Um, at any rate, um, and so I called Monica and we had a really nice conversation. And about halfway through, I said, so, Monica, we could just continue this on the next DTT. So that's where we are. Um, and uh, one of your biggest fans, Monica, I don't even know if you know this, is Karen Fassenpower. <laughs> and um, and anyway, and so I thought, ah, I could get Karen to come talk to us too. So this is a, um, we were just saying here at, before the official beginning that um, this is an, a low key, uh, just checking in with each other, just learning what we've been learning. Um, but Monica, uh, let's start with you, if you don't mind, um, because you did make a big decision um, this year. Uh, so, do you mind? Uh, I don't know how. I I was thinking. I'm not sure how we're going to. Um, well, it'll just come out. Like, let's assume people know you a little bit, but not a lot. Do you want to just introduce yourself and tell us? where you are now and a little bit about how you got there. Okay. So, yeah. And I'll start with the few feeling being quite mutual to both you and Karen. So Thanks. happy to be having a conversation. I sent an email to Karen earlier. I mean, how nice to just transport ourselves to a coffee shop. Um, wish that that could actually happen, but um, this is the next best, best thing. So kind of a short, well, I guess, the, the really, really short history. Um, as far as what you were referencing, me resigning from an official um, position, to me, it's it's really not that different um, from five years ago when, or four, maybe four years ago, when we hit the point in um, the quiet revolution where we realized from the pilot math class that not enough kids were um, passionate enough about school math to self-direct. That's the pilot math class was self-directing your pre-AP algebra two. Um, and when we we they then went to the curriculum committee and asked permission to write their own curriculum the next year. I heard all through this Will Richardson's advice to do it for yourself. You know, you're gonna do tech, do it for yourself first. So. I'm hearing this as the kids are picking their own curriculum. What what would keep them impassioned, you know, for nine months? Um, mine was global equity. <laughs> and so from that point, um, because I had space to really search what mattered, you know, and it was cool that we were able to do something, I think, on the edge four or five years ago. Um, it didn't feel right to my soul that, seven billion people couldn't do it, you know. So to me, this resignation from the district um, wasn't a big flashy thing. Um, it's because I really hadn't been teaching like we, we know teaching for four years. Um, it was just another step along the way, you know, of now me swimming in the vulnerability of not knowing this and um, also feeling a responsibility, as I referenced to you, Paul, I heard um, Jane Costello talk. She's, uh, a lot of the details I'll get wrong, which is fitting with the whole quiet revolution of our memory isn't like a computer, and that's why, a lot of reasons why school as is doesn't work. Um, but, um, so that was just a disclaimer to, I'm sorry for things that I might get wrong, but Jane was talking about, um, her work with um, some indigenous tribe in the North Carolina mountains and and work with university students and addictions and screening people for various things and um, it was the Q&A and somebody asked her um, um, about screening and she said, I believe that it's unethical to screen people for something when you don't have a mechanism in place. Um, that actually happened after I resigned, um, but um, that really helped me in a way. It was very 
poignant to my heart, but it also helped me to understand a lot of what I'd been doing um, and how I couldn't fit places um, because like t t to come on TTT and have you guys be talking about stuff that you're doing today, right now, in classrooms that are very important because that's where people are. Um, and then for me to be talking about a vision that can't happen yet because there isn't a mechanism in place, in a way, like what she said, that it's unethical. It's almost unethical to do that um, because you're 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 almost telling people that this isn't good, but I don't have anything better, you know. So just be sad about that, you know. So that was that was really helpful to me. And um, so can I, just a response just to that TTT part. Um, I I usually experience that as you know, pushing and reminding us of what we're really aiming toward. Um, so, yeah. Yes, it was sometimes jarring and, oh, wait, here, here <laughs> or idealistic or whatever it seems sometimes, but I welcome that voice, though. And so. I never felt <clears throat> unwelcome. But uh, yeah. my, one thing that I've learned over these last five years um, is how important listening is. Um, and if you narrow down, well, just mo a little more background for mm -hmm. people who might not know. The last five years have been spent in kind of an incubated space, listening to mostly youth without an agenda of how they might, how we all might change up our days so that people aren't stressed so much, you know. And it kind of narrowed down to two conversations. What if again because most of the people are in public education and most of public education defines our mindset you know for at least the 12 plus years but usually after that what if we ch what if we were able to literally redefine public education so that it would be an equitable thing um, and it ba it was based on two conversations one with yourself daily and one with a group um, you know me um, of maybe seven daily as well um, so that you get to that authenticity of yourself truly being yourself so there's the listening to yourself and you get to the um, attachment of being known by someone and being invited to exist um, and so now back to I've I've been a pretty good public education person while I was a student you know, doing everything exactly how it was supposed to, um, and then as a teacher trying to all all the way through to, college, Monica. I don't even know. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. you know, a perfectionist, which most people might claim that you know, um, but that's kind of what the institution wants us to be. You know, wants us to be obedient, follow directions, seek to be efficient. Um, um, rather than effective, perhaps. Um, but anyway, when you do that, you you don't think it's legitimate or legal to listen to your gut. You think it's utopian. You think it's um, selfish. So many different things. And so through this process, again, back to Will, um, do it for yourself first. I just felt like if this was going to be legit, I need to be throwing myself into it completely as well. And so in talking to myself and listening to my gut the last five years, um, now back to TTT, no one made me feel unwelcome or, or bad. But list, I needed to start listening to my gut more and what, why did I not feel good after the session, you know? And so Jane Costello's little answer really helped me that um, it's more about having something in place than maybe preaching about something or theorizing about something. And that really, I feel like, is how we got to where we got because we we prototyped and experimented for five years. We weren't there. We we would listen to amazing people. We would read read amazing books. Or I, youth are brilliant themselves, and we wouldn't just theorize about it. We would 
try it out. You know, we were in this incubated space, and if people thought we were crazy, that was okay. That we were supposed to be crazy. You know. Um, uh huh. Um, and I, I um, so what I'm hearing you say is that I do sort of think of you in a terms of philosophy or theory, um, but you're saying that it's been a very practical journey for you. I mean, now the last about the last maybe almost a year, um, it's been it's almost like gathering up all this stuff reflecting on the stuff but for five years it was total immersion and experimenting and prototyping and you know just trying things and not feeling like we had to prove anything which really gives you a lot of space if you're not playing defense all the time and you're just experimenting and feeling free enough to do that every day honestly the five years feel to me like 10 to 20 years worth of research um, so yeah, the last year has been really more just a few of us and, a, and oftentimes just me rethinking and trying to, trying to at least for myself, pen some of this. Um. Mm -hmm. Karen, do you want to jump in? or? <laughs> well, so, so what are your big takeaways from those five years? Um, so... I can break it down to the year. Um, the first year that we did the pilot math program, well, before that, what we decided when we looked around and we were like, why is everyone stressed? You know, it's not, we weren't just looking at kids wanting to be freed from something. They were noticing teachers stressed, parents stressed, community members stressed. And then why were we beholden to the seven hours a day that was either work or school? So we thought, well, what we have to work with now is math <laughs> and whoever wants to play this game and so we kind of did you know um, blended learning, flipped classroom um, you know had a amazing experience with a, a pre-AP Algebra 2 class we called it the pilot math class again at the end of that year we decided not enough people were passionate about enough about school math so they got permission to write their own curriculum. So this that year was the first year we called it the Innovation Lab. Kids were writing, were studying um, human trafficking and homelessness, um, game design, um, Hebrew, just a gamut of, of things. At the end of that year, the conclusion, the findings and the failings were that even if you write your own curriculum and, and you're beholden to that for nine months, you compromise the grit that comes from doing the thing that you can't not do. Um, not the grit that makes you um, strong enough to withstand oppression, but the grit that you, you can't wait to wake up every day and you can barely go to sleep at night because it's the thing you can't not do and you really aren't losing energy from it because it's just feeding you. Um, so then they asked permission to, could we just say we're going to be in the lab? you know and then at the end of the year if we want to be credentialed for something we get credentialed for it a lot of the kids would end up not even wanting to get credentialed because the experience was so huge and as you guys know there's so many strings and everything um, with the credentialing so then that next year is when we moved off of a campus and into a house downtown the BU house and um, that was when you know, at this point, I feel like we really have experimented quite extensively and found out enough. That year is when I feel like we really found out how to set an individual free in a space of permission where they have nothing to prove. Um, they were doing amazing things, but the roadblocks were there's there wasn't enough people. You know, if you wanted to do your thing in a group, which you do when you get stripped down to your the thing you can't not do, you crave co-creation, you crave your tribe. Um, and there just wasn't enough people. So what we would end up doing is you would need to be doing these this other group's thing as a deal because then they would do your thing, you know, which is great and that involves community and there's a place for that, but it didn't get at the grit that would keep you just so locked into the thing you cannot do. Um, so that's where we kind of felt like we'd Sorry, there's there's then one more year that then we were um, 
moved out of the house into the city, which the first year that we did the pilot math class, I gave the kids all the math stuff they needed to know um, at the beginning of the year and said, this is what you need to know. I'm here if you need me, kind of a Sukkot Mitra type approach. Um, so they, they did that successfully, a lot of peer tutorials, you know, a, a lot of different things. We had a, a self-directed grid that we made up that had all the resources, got a lot of insight from Michael Wesh about an um, editable syllabus. So with the extra time from that, they wrote up this plan of how to redefine school. And it, the bottom line of that was the, what if the city was the school. Um, and so the last year then, we, we did move into the city and we were in coffee shops and the library and different businesses that um, would let us have like, you know, a bit of an office space or whatever or space just to go do stuff. Um, can, can I ask, um, and these are, you said at the beginning, these are public school kids you're working with, right? Um, they, were, and, they, were a, they were a mix. Uh-huh. So the, it seemed like that what you were doing, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that uh, parents would kind of sign off that they were being homeschooled and then they would be able to come to your lab? Is that how, it, just practically, that's how it worked? If they wanted to be full-time, they wrote the letter of intent to homeschool. Uh -huh. um, if they wanted to just do a couple classes in the lab, you know, regular class hours go to the lab, um, then they didn't. We had numbers that the counselors could code in to be in the lab. So what was the motivation of the actually homeschooled kids to come to the lab? Well, there were some kids that left the system to do that um, because we found out through the, the different years that if you, if you have this in the background, this other stuff that you're getting graded for and that you know you feel like you have to do, it trumps the stuff that you really wish you could be doing. Um, so some kids just were like, I'm just going for it, you know. Um, but the kid, the problem with homeschoolers and unschoolers is the same problem that we found that last year is that there's just not enough players. There's not enough people playing in order for each little geek to have their tribe on a daily basis and then also have the freedom to change their mind every day. So talk understand. about the yeah. numbers, like how yeah. many kids were in this and, and what's your sense of like what is the critical mass? Numbers are awful. Um, and so we on our thing we've kind of drawn it up but with the understanding that there's, you just, people want, you can't do that with people but the first year that we started talking about this there were about 200 youth locally and about 200 youth globally that were having this conversation. Um, then the year that we did the pilot math class, there were 120-ish kids signed up for pre-AP Algebra 2 where I was teaching. So I sent a letter out to all those families and said, do you want to do this crazy thing? If you do, parents, you have to sign off a year-long field trip waiver not holding us liable for anything. So 30 kids decided to do that. So there were 30 that year. But of course, there's all these others, you know, we were, we were, we were constantly talking to a, a class in Croatia. I mean, I could go on with global groups that were involved, but there were also still all those groups locally involved that, you know, were still in the conversation. Then the year that we, um, we stayed at the high school I was at, but moved to a tech building that was detached, kind of, um, and that was the first year that we called it the Innovation Lab. There were probably... That, you're calling, you're calling the... I, by the way, I count six years, but <laughs> whatever, because you have a zero year in there too, or something, right? But go ahead, all, and all these are laid out graphically very nicely, and there's a link to. Yeah, the, if you go to the, the storyboard. Um, yeah. Um, but, so then, the, the year that we started the innovation lab, there were maybe fifty, um, and at least half of those were homeschooler and end schoolers that came in at that point. Um, but they were all ages. It wasn't just high school. Um, and then the next year that we moved to the house, again there were probably 50 that floated in and out, maybe a little more, and, and there it was truly from three-year-old to 80-year-old. Um, and that's where we got the feel of this really has to be two things. It has to be in the city, and that could be community, but it has to be eclectic ages. 
Um, and it needs to be as the day. It can't be an after hours thing. If, if we really want this to take hold and, and cause global equity, um, if we want it to be better than what we have now, there's a lot, there's so much good going on, you know, that we didn't feel like we needed to, to keep at that because it's already happening in so many schools. Um, but if we want to make this be a global equity thing, um, it needs to be in the city eclectic resources and people and as the day it, that's your 24 7 thing you don't have to do other stuff um, as far as numbers at this point um, I mean I, I don't really know I know that we you know we we've experienced when I talk with Nikhil he talks about you know let's try it with 100 150 I feel like we really did try it with that many I, I do feel like it's more in the realm of a thousand if you want to have, unless unless you just have a hundred, then you really need to tap into the virtual. Well, that's what I was going to ask next, right? So you talked about sort of this craving your tribe and and finding the community, and you've mentioned several times being in the city. And and one of the things, myself having moved from an urban environment to an extremely rural environment where there's just nobody around, I I do feel that sort of that pull to community but how do you do that in a setting you know whether it's whether it's rural or whether it's you have such a specific interest that there just aren't people and how does that translate to digital spaces and I feel like in some ways it does but in some ways it's not the same I think it so so my personal start of all this was I joined Seth Godin's online tribe five years ago and then I met a guy there that was from Belgium, and we Skyped, and I, I wasn't into technology at all. We Skyped 24-7 for probably six months. It was like you're at, you found your astro twin that felt the same way about global equity and that public education could be a part of that. So I came back and started that pilot math class thinking this could all be virtual. I mean, we did a call out with on Seth Godin's tribe's got some incredible mentors for all the kids. Um, and, and that was one of the findings that year, too, that you does really... That re by the way, does that resource still exist, this Seth Godin's tribes? I don't know um, I'm it. pretty sure it's still... Mm -hmm. It's okay. it tribes with three I's. Okay. P-R-I-I-I-B-E-S. Right. good. And it's, I just it's, wanted to reference it. Yeah. 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 Um, and so... So I, I came in thinking it could all be virtual, you know, Sukkot Mitra style, and we could have Granny in the Cloud style, um, which he's a, he's a huge influence um, to a lot of what we've done. I think there needs to be a mix as much as there can be a mix. I, I don't think you should be totally just local, and I don't think you should totally be just virtual. Some places have to be one or the other. Um, initially maybe and so that's another thing now our end vision here is how do we get people to believe this crazy thing that we've come up with that the city could be the school and if the city was the school we would find global equity you know something so simple and, and all it comes from is people talking to themselves every day for at least three minutes initially and meeting with seven people for 30 minutes and the rest of the day is theirs that's that's crazy how could we get people to believe that that could change the world. We That's feel a like really great summary. Let's, let's sorry. Let's, we really feel like I wanna, if, go ahead, Monica. Could we I, could can model we, that? Okay. If we could model that in a city um, for six months to a year, um, that's going to speak more volumes than writing a book or talking about it or presenting it. If people could actually see a city changed, but they. At, even if that happened, they could say, well, that's just Loveland, Colorado. So we've also got some other cities that completely rural, com you know, maybe don't even have the tech, you know, connectedness um, that we would all, we would either try it alongside or right after we did um, the initial city. So just wanted to throw that in. As, that's kind of where we're at right now. Meaning you're still, you're, you're, even though you've resigned, you're still creating a, a, a mechanism, a place, a, um, a, a what, uh, to make this happen? Yeah, I mean, 
it again to me the resignation means nothing. I mean, okay, but yeah. it just gave me more. You know, the only real difference is I'm not getting paid. You know, um, perhaps, um, but it no, it, it was it was more. I this is the thing I can't not do. So I just mm -hmm. I really you know. So what I'm doing now is just reading like crazy, making connections as best I can, um, understanding it better myself. Like conversations that we've had is, if we would have tried to to do some of this a year ago, which I thought we should have done it five years ago, I was really disheartened when this mentor from Belgium said, no, it's going to take like four years. And I'm like, it is not. There's no way I can wait that long. Um, but even this last year, um, I've learned some things that if we would have started started a year ago, um, I would have had people asking me questions that I would have gone, huh, I never thought about that. You know, it's just this year has just been a tying up of loose ends and helping it to be more of a narrative for 100% of humanity. Um, so, yeah, it's just... There was a detail in your summary a little bit earlier that I hadn't heard before, and that's meeting with seven people every day. Um, what happens in that? So uh, on this, so just a, the site now um, is like a Wikipedia style site that hopefully is helpful to people that want to know more about it. But it's also a prototype of maybe someone's brain. And, and by brain, I mean that is the trail, maybe the future credentialing that we have, um, but more important, the future connector that we have, that every day tech is listening to us without an agenda in those three minutes that we talk to ourselves and connecting us locally or globally. Um, so now, just go with me to this place. It's not necessarily the case, but say the site now is my brain. And it's, it's been developed because we've put stuff on there, um, and it doesn't look complete, but you can search stuff and you can see what we've been studying and you can see the connections we've been making, and, and it's all linked and, and things like that. Um, but imagine in the future that that wasn't created by people spending time adding pages, five pages or so a day. It's just from you talking to yourself and the tech doing the thing that it does best taking tons and tons of data and organizing it and and most of all listening without an agenda um, it's compiling it so that's just to tell you about the site the site now could be a prototype of a brain what it would look like in the future so you can use the search there and you can put in the search two conversations or you can go under grokking it's a glossary um, but two conversations gives a graphic of how we see the day and this is a temporary thing. It's not natural, but it's like a counter to take care of the man-made construct that we've created with public education. So, so say three minutes a day you talk to yourself in this device and it gathers. Now the new data is your self-talk, which you're curious about what matters to you. And that's what it uses to connect and to make this trail like maybe the site would be for each person, whatever, with nodes connecting. Um, so that takes care of your authenticity. You feel like the two major things, if it's a narrative for 100% of humanity, is people need to be themselves. If we want this to sustain itself without having money be a motivator or grades or any of those things, and we want people to be healthy and not be beholden to feeling like they have to cause, commit crimes, authenticity is important. So could the I? Second, sorry, I know you. Uh, maybe go ahead. Go ahead. Tell us the second thing. Oh, and I'm sorry, the second part of the answer to your question. That's why it's it's hard because. <laughs> go ahead. So the second part is attachment. Um, oh, there's so much research. Um, I'm not going to think of her name. Jane. Um, Jean. Jean. Uh, you could put Jean in. J E A N. <laughs> Just research on attachment, just from birth to two years old. And um, Gabor Mate talks about attachment, that um, we don't have the attachment, the natural attachment to people. 
we, we send five-year-olds off to kindergarten to attach to their peers and then we wonder when they're teenagers why they don't listen to us and they listen to their peers. And then Gabor says, we spend the rest of our life um, trumping our authenticity in order to gain that attachment that we lost. So part of the plan then is, okay, to get that attachment back in the beginning, it'll be kind of fake, but it's to take care of people who might not have a family situation where they feel that attachment. Um, so, they, so they meet with seven people, random people in the beginning perhaps, but they meet with them every day for 30 minutes. There's no agenda for that meeting. You don't have to do anything. You can just sit there. Um, but you're, the goal is that you'll be known by someone, that over time you would get to know each other. The other side of it is that with this talking to yourself, you know, you might say you're interested in China. I might say I'm interested in China. The technology tells us to meet up that day. We meet up and you said, I met China the plate. I say, I met China the country. So it's kind of like Groundhog's Day. We don't feel bad about that meeting. We know that tomorrow we get another go at it. You know, so we can game the system and, and say really weird stuff. Or we can say, this is kind of working. I might really find my tribe, you know. So if you end up really finding your tribe, the people that you meet with could become the tribe. But initially, just to make sure that it's public education and that equity is happening and that everybody has a safe spot. Like, we came up with seven or eight because of when we divided staff in our district with the youth in our district, it was a one to eight ratio. Did that answer your question? It did. Yeah, it did. Or did you um, forget what your question was? No, I, I, I remembered. No, it's good. Um, that's fine. Um, so I, the bigger, so I really like um, the focus on what's the day like. Like that, that is a, a really concrete um, way to make this understandable, I think. Um, do you so, want to go more into the day yeah. then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so now we're at the point where, and this is where it's gonna, people are gonna say crazy, whatever, which is fine because I'm at the point now where, for 20 years teaching how to rationalize a denominator, and I was plotted, you know, because that's a good thing to do, and now I'm realizing that's the craziest thing to do. And this, what I'm going to tell you about, and this whole thing we've been doing is the most rational thing I've ever done. So now we're thinking, okay. Twenty million dollars. What if we had twenty million dollars? That just came flippantly one day um, because Gates was giving another twenty million, seventeen point nine million to the state of Colorado. So we said, if we had twenty million dollars, how would we divide that up to to experiment with the citywide um, plan? And so that's what we're 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 gathering and connecting and hoping that someone, some movie star that wants to bet on something better than what we've, we have. Um, somebody with a lot of money, because there's a lot of money being thrown at things today, sees this and wants to support it. So say they do, okay? So about eight million of that would go towards, we've already worked out um, sabbaticals for teachers um, so that they could play for a year without feeling like at the end of the year, if it didn't work out, they would be all messed up. You know, they just go right back into the flow of things. Parents that have been involved and, and want, they're not doing the job they really want to be doing and they want to play for a year and, and they wouldn't need, maybe they would need, you know, a uh, salary or maybe they would just need the restaurant that they've always wanted to start, you know. But that, about eight million would go towards people. So we'd have enough people to play for a year to act this out. About seven or eight million would go towards spaces. So now to the answer of how the day plays out. You three minutes you talk to yourself, thirty minutes you meet with a group of seven. The rest of the day you have now these at least ten spaces that we want to purchase. That one would be like a maker space, one would be a community kitchen, a recording studio. Christians actually made a city sketch up. So if you put in the search city sketch up you can see where he's turned a Google sketch up into a video of some of the ideas that we've had over the last five years. Some of the things we would do is we would walk through the downtown and see all these empty spaces and say, how cool if this was this? How cool if this was this? And we'd talk to community members and what would you like this to be? 
Um, and then about five million would go towards what I believe is why this can happen now and why Holt dreamed of it and said this is so doable and so urgent and so, where Elick had all these ideas but it didn't happen is I think we have the tech now to actually facilitate the chaos of seven billion people following their whimsy you know so um, the tech would create the device um, that would not only be you know I'm imagining some wearable device even a chip that it initially it's um, has a base that it listens to you without an agenda it, it connects you to other people you know connects those nodes and it creates this trail like the site could be it could look like that or whatever um, so the brain if you put in the search the brain is a, the closest software to what we see similar to what we're talking about but it could also be um, personally fabricated so people could recode it you know um, I've talked to so many amazing people and this guy in Australia was he, he's worked with Thad Star I don't know if he's worked with Thad Starner but he's worked with Steve Mann the guys who have worn Google glasses Google glass types for like 10 years and um, he suggested the next iteration we've iterated this app so many different ways a Google Doc to video recording to chalkboards outside of a coffee house um, and he suggested that we try a wearable, like a, ne a necklace, um, but that it be non-functional. And again, here I was impatient. I was like, no, I'm four, five years in. I can't wear a non-functional device and prototype with it. But that was huge because you don't realize when you get these devices how much coding and how much assumption is baked into it you know and when you wear something that's non-functional and every day you're deciding what you wish it could do so anyway the chip could then you know wherever it ends up in Mukana Uganda or wherever people could refabricate it if they wanted to but it would have this basic in it the five million would also go for you know Wi-Fi and every, making sure everyone has these, these devices you said there were ten spaces that's a, approximately two. Yeah. Um, what we've envisioned just again you know yeah. being a math person and being so caught up in detail <laughs> what I've realized is and, and John Cage has just been great about that is like that's all bunk so we have a page on the site called ish and we try to say ish or ness after everything because nothing is definite you know so yeah we just said ten spaces yeah. mostly because there were kind of ten different, ten-ish different groupings. Like people were really interested in recording and video and, and sharing their story and, and you know, making music and, and things. And people were really interested in farming and permaculture and, and then cooking and, you know. Um, and so that's, that's just how those came up. Mm. A lot of crowdsourcing over the last five years. Mm. Cool. Uh, would you mind going off on a little eddy here, and and maybe uh, Karen can throw in what what's in your makerspace? What's a, um? And I mentioned right when we started that um, I'm going to be on a design team here in New York City, where there's a maker academy starting. Um, I'm just and I'm just wondering what would be would that be okay to, to just describe that a little more? Like what's in that makerspace? Well, um. We have had so many amazing people involved in this. Um, unschooling families whose kids Skype with the MIT Media Lab because they're, you know, giving them suggestions about Scratch, and um, mm -hmm. and then um, a family that um, their kids were actually part of the pilot math program, and, and they were the ones that other kids were requesting them to do tutorials. So just amazing people. The second family have put robotics in the district on the side. It hasn't been through the system. Um, but anyway, heavily involved in robotics and done amazing things. And so we've had funny conversations about what the makerspace would be like, you know, anywhere from so because they have all the equipment for all this and they, they won gone to world championships and, and won them. Um, so we have that equipment 
for that really geeky side of a maker space. But we also have groups of people that want a space where they would just go knit, where they would just go um, dance, you know. So um, this last iteration, Christian's made a bunch of Google SketchUps, but this last iteration, we kind of decided to, rather than specify that this was a dance studio, this was a recording studio, maybe even just call them maker spaces, because by now people might have changed their minds about the spaces. And I guess I should say too that, and this fits with, with a maker space, the reason that we wanted to buy 10 spaces is because through the five years, imagining that spaces in the city would be spaces we would want to move into and then redo high school spaces and middle school spaces possibly. And working with policy and bureaucracy and having the flexibility to let a space morph as much as we feel it's important to let a person morph. You know, if, if, if a person should have the freedom and the bravery to change their mind every day, we should be able to change spaces. You know, of course that means listening to every everyone, you know, but a group of people want to change spaces just as much too. So um, owning community-owned spaces where we could change the space to this week it's a completely robotic maker space or even today this morning it's a completely robotic maker space and at night it's total knitting maker space. Initially though like we've always talked about that an original maker space would just be totally eclectic you know kind of like Gaber Tolley's tinkering school um, and maybe even more eclectic than that but just and then it would be staffed with people that their only job is to bring whatever they want to do so that they're not hovering over people and, and infringing on their space, but their only job is to listen. You know, like people that would come into that space, their only pay when they left that space every day was to leave their curiosity. So that like a true unschooling, really nurturing family um, where you really know each other, you know their curiosities, and so you strew, you know, a book, a video, a machine that fits whatever they talked about that night. That we feel is very important in a maker space. That you're listening to the, the the people that come in, and whatever they wished or they were curious about when they come back the next time, there might be a few things that they could tinker with in that. Yeah. Um, it does sound like it's it's tricky to figure out how to resource something, have enough resources and be flexible to morph at the same time? Well, that's, that's the beauty yeah. of the whole upcycling thing. Uh -huh. it, being immersed like this, I mean, we're so stuck in our schools, and we have lots of resources in schools, but beca again, because no, of I don't bureaucracy... Do. I don't <laughs> well, because of bureaucracy, yeah. they're so hand-tied. Like, you get yeah. a huge grant for this, and there you get amazing things, but in the fine print, it's you know, it's it's the system, it's nobody's fault, but in the fine print, it's, you can only use this after school, you know, mm -hmm. or you can only, or if we, if somebody hurts it, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, um, moving into the city and, and finding out all the resources, people and things, um, you, you really probably have all you need if people were freed up to find those things, you know. So when we were in the BU house, people were bringing stuff all the time. We we never had to buy anything. Um, things were just donated left and right. So that becomes part of what you do. Yeah. Is, is get resourced. Yeah. Uh -huh. It just they just show up, you know. And then a lot, a lot of the people that want to be a part of it, you know, it's almost like you end up with too many resources, you know, um, because you're you're bringing in all these eclectic people people that haven't been involved in the school system, that have all these really cool things but no people to do it with, are happy to share it. If they, the difference that we did find out is if, if it wasn't like a, not to bash big brother, big sister, because that's incredible, but a lot of the times those connections are, for the kids' mindset, it's they get out of school to do that. Um, and And this was a different mindset. It was this was the thing I can't not do. It's not like I'm getting community hours for this or it's this is my passion. I, you know, like we have videos of kids saying, I just can't get enough of this, you know. Well, the mentor 
ish people in the community that have all those resources are more than happy to have them come in and work on their ceramic wheel or whatever because they know this kid is totally passionate. This kid was them when they were little. So could I bring you back to the day? Because <laughs> that, sure. that's the narrative that's making sense to me. Um, so and, and I'm wondering when do mentors fit in the day? Because mentorship is a really important part of your model, is it not? You... Well, everyone's a mentor, right? So that's how it fits. Initially, because we're... And I guess I should say, too, just so... We don't, we're not trying to get rid of anything. Um, we're just trying to help people think and, and just maybe realign things, you know. Um, I really think school as is might end up being 10% of the people that want that. If it's more, that's fine, that's great. Um, but I don't think most people want it exactly like it is, you know. But in this transition time, we're imagining that that general makerspace would be kind of like a, a daycare-ish space because until things get worked out where parents aren't working full-time or whatever, they're still going to need a space for their kids. And, and in those spaces, the proportions might be different than we would like to see in the future. Um, so in those spaces when maybe they're younger kids, um, just making sure that people that feel like they're in the mentor role realize the difference between teaching and mentoring alongside. Again, that whole emphasis of you, the best way that you can model something is you doing it. Um, and so, like learning to walk and learning to talk, nobody gave you a lesson on that. Um, there's a great quote by Matt Hearn in um, New Natural Born Learners, I think is the book that just recently came out, and he says, you know, at five, year old, at five years old, we try to teach kids a language that they taught themselves to speak. We, we try to teach them to, to, to read a language that they taught themselves to speak. Um, so... What? <laughs> Go ahead, Karen. You have a thought? Or? Well, so take, take that to a a bigger level of just this whole quest for authenticity and attachment is that something that you see in the adult community you're in and is that you know d doesn't that need to happen I mean I, I think is this a high school project or is this like a bigger societal thing and to what degree have you crossed into that or think it would be that in the future well since the first year in the lab it was a cross-generational thing. Um, the only and was that challenging? No, I mean that's we're missing out on the dance. We're missing out on the dance of humanity because we're we're trying to work on just third graders or we're trying to work on just a high school. The dance of humanity is the 80 year old with the 12 year old that they both they're a tribe, they're a they're connected with some passion, you know, and now neither one of them are on medication, drugs, or, you know, because no one's visiting them in the nursing home. Um, so you, that's what makes it easier when you zoom out far enough that it is, it is all ages. Yeah, mm -hmm. since, since that pilot math program four years ago, it's been about, it's, it's all ages. So, so do you feel like in your community, Take like, this is just a ridiculous question, but people between 30 years old and 60 years old, what percentage of those people do you think identify a passion and have authenticity and attachment toward it? Right now? Yeah. And they're doing it? Yes. Or even can articulate it. Okay, so a lot of them can't, and that's where the detox comes in. Right. And that's another reason why doing this in a community you know, getting the 20 million so we could do it all at once. The synchronicity is so important because if we had the tech, that would shorten the time between intention and action every day, and the detox time would be much shorter. Um, but one of the things that I did along the lines of listening is 
had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Now I'm going into pluralistic ignorance here that I heard that term from Zeynep, um, who's an amazing um, gal. Um, pluralistic ignorance is the whole idea of I think I'm the only one that doesn't like things the way they are, but everyone else looks happy, so they, it must be fine. When actually everyone else is thinking the same exact thing, you know. Um, and so it was really important to have, and technology helped with this. Like I, I would be in a group of people talking to some really high up political people or whatever um, that I knew were supportive of what we were doing, and in the group they wouldn't sound that way. And it would it would blow me away, and then I'd get a tweet, a DM that night, that what you're doing is great. You know, I totally support it. And it's again, it's the system that's making us be like we don't want to be. So I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. A lot of us did, and a lot of my confidence comes from knowing there are seven billion people that are craving authenticity and attachment, and if they don't already have it. This is the mechanism that we're working on to help them get there in a very short time. So is that a challenge, the societal impulse away from that or towards something else, is that a challenge more than the money? I mean, what are the big challenges to you to really move this forward to 7 billion people? Um, well, I, you know, I, I would maybe say the money, but I really don't. I really am feeling this year has really helped me with the whole idea of timing. <laughs> and I really feel like it's it's a matter of timing. When because people have said, I know this person could get you that money. I, I know they would want to do this. But our philosophy has always been that it has to be no strings attached. And once you ask someone for it, there's strings attached, you know. Mm. Seth Godin talks about being remarkable, and that means people remark about you. You don't, you know. So part of it is just timing. I don't, I think it's coming. I, I feel that it's truly coming. People say, you know, there's so many things that are against it, and, you know, all these people are, there's so many conversations already going on about education. Um, but I know in people's hearts from the, hundreds and hundreds of conversations that I've had where, you know, people have come to tears or whatever. People are craving this for themselves, but more so for their kids. Yeah. And so I guess my answer is I used to think it was the money. If we could just hurry up and get the money, we could start playing this out because I know people are ready to play it out. And I part of me still feels that way. But I'm also resolving and feeling really good about timing and that timing is really crucial um, in this. I, I guess the bottom line I could say is I really feel like if we can model this in the city for six months to a year, to me that's that's where it could turn on a dime because if we could have modeled it and then we have the mechanism in place where it could go anywhere, I do believe within a year anywhere, anybody anywhere could take advantage of it and opt in to, to trying something different like this. You know, I'm not sure, but I think, I wonder if the funding shouldn't come from a, you know, a movie star and maybe should come from the community in some way. Um, well, you know, <coughs> I think it will go both ways, you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of the, I mean, 20 million isn't sustainable it will be once things change because part of our plan, I mean, when you go to the site, one of the big things we talk about is a new economy, you know, to where it's a, and we've prototyped that and, you know, how to do more of, you know, what do you have and what do you need and time, talent, share um, type things. But initially, 20 million might not even be sustainable. So we've had these conversations about, it's like, it's a synchronicity going into it that like once people hear there's more like they hear somebody's going to give you this vast amount of money yeah there's a lot of local people that would probably kick in right away and yet there, there is more ownership with that the problem that we've come up with time and time again people are completely for this or anything you know anything good but we're all too busy 
so we forget about it. Now we're back to that hey, shortening the time between intention and action. We have too much leg time today. You know, we might have these great ideas. The leg time is too huge, you know. Um, so to me, getting a warmth right in. You know, here's another piece that you guys might be more intrigued in is it's very fitting with um, fandom. Um, the, one of the latest things we wrote up is A Quiet Revolution, a slide deck of fitting with um, Mockingjay coming out next descent November. It's in two parts. Um, and then the next November, um, the HP Alliance and Andrew Slack have started talking about Hunger Games uh, on their Harry Potter Alliance site um, and how these authors have written about things that are legit. So now, you know, we, we talk about we're so worried about kids being so illiterate when actually there's millions of kids who are very literate about what our society is really doing to ourselves, you know, and there's certain verbiage within those that literature that once this kicks in all we have to do is talk that language with them. Those tribes are already ready. They just don't have a mechanism to occupy. A lot of these things are ready and primed and know there needs to be a change but it's I hear Bill Strickland in the back of my head it's there's not a mechanism created to make that to take it the next step. So we're getting close to an hour here, and we could go on. Um, and I, I love how much you've been able to talk to me. It's great. Um, are there places where this is happening a little bit? You just started mentioning Occupy and other things, but are there places where you see some of this vision coming, like pieces of it happening already? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and this is another thing. In order for this to happen, and this is where the math that we never learn in school, that, that we're never told to teach kids in school, you know, um, comes into play, the, the infinitesimally small of if I discriminate down to my thumbprint, then I'm not prejudiced to other people. Um, and so that helps in, like I'll throw some names out here and people will go, oh, they're involved with them, you know. That's what we have to get over, you know, because if it's a narrative for 100% of humanity, it's a narrative for 100% of humanity. We can't, it's an and game, you know. So anyway, having said that, um, Peter Joseph um, and the Zeitgeist Movement, um, Charles Eisenstein, and um, he wrote a book called Sacred Economics, and I'm just finishing up a book now that um, he wrote called the, the Beautiful World That Our Hearts Know. And by the way, Monica, I wanted to mention I love how you're a public intellectual on Twitter in that we get to see all of your, your comments as you're reading. Well, that's another thing that – that's how I take notes. And then those – I copy and paste those onto the, the page on the site. So another thing the site does is it helps my memory, you know. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's transparency definitely. But – so the answer to your question, I could go on and on. A lot of them are on the site. Um, okay. The site is modeling that there's so much out there. There's so many people that have experimented with basic income. Um, and then we've just kind of not paid attention to the results, even though the results were phenomenal, you know. Um, so all of that is logged on the site. Um, and yeah, there's now, tons of stuff. Peggy, Peggy asked, I saw here, Karen, do you want to say is asking about Black Mountain Soul. Is that is that where Steve Harkonnen is um, yeah. camping out or whatever he's doing? Exactly. Uh, we should we should find out what he's doing too. Yeah. But yeah. does anybody know <laughs> what's happening at Black Mountain these days? Peggy, anybody know? No, okay. So anyway, that's one possibility. I, yeah, I do, but I I think it would be oh. good to have Steve on. Um, did, yeah. And by the way, I'd love to talk to you sometime about John Cage. Did you know that John Cage was at Black Mountain Soul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. There's a there's a great book by um, Duberman, I think, where he he describes the Black Mountain experience. And what's wonderful is he's a historian, but he just goes into the old transcripts and just makes up as if he were there. Um, <laughs> so you can't. But anyway, it's a, it's a lovely history of the Black Mountain. Yeah. So I'm glad Peggy brought that up because you know yeah. I. 
again, the human memory doesn't work good, but Black Mountain Soul, the Mosaic School, all the Sudbury schools, um, there's amazing things going on within public education. Um, you, you couldn't even list them all. Um, mm -hmm. So now I'm back to George Seaman's quote of, there's pools of innovation everywhere. Um, there's just not a cohesive structure to affect it, you know, to make it zap, and, you know, and it, it could just slowly, gradually get there. You know, that's going to happen, and I'm confident in that. I want to hasten that. You know, I think everybody wants to hasten it as, as, as much as we can. Cool. So can I ask personally, um, how, how are you supporting yourself? <laughs> I mean, uh, what's your business model? <laughs> my business model is, um, well, you know, I could say... 20 years in public education, um, I, when I resigned, I found out in six years I'll get my para money. So that was helpful. I had decided to resign regardless. Um, but um, I'm going to go live with Karen for a while. That's what Yeah, I <laughs> farm. Grow your own food. It's amazing how little you can live on. It is, yeah. you know. I, it, it's just amazing because, it, again, it's pushed me into this realm of what if what if you have nothing really you know so Fair it's enough. all an ex experience and an experiment and um, well yeah. I, I hope somebody sees this broadcast and says we should talk to her more <laughs> that's a, maybe another way to support too but anyway um, thank you Monica I think we should close off but you have any last thoughts that you want to what is there I'm a totally there? dominated, so and oh, I want to that was the intention. Rest. That was the intention. We can get our stories out too. It's all good. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, but I, we're going to close for tonight. Unless you have anything else you'd like to say, Monica. Any okay. last thoughts? You're thank good. you, guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you, um, and thank you, Karen, and those in the chat room. Um, so uh, you might have noticed. Uh, go to edtechtalk.com. Um, the ed Tech, what do they call them? So, Ed Tech Talk folks have started uh, coming back with a with a podcast, uh, a webcast um, on Sunday evenings. I think it is. Um, so that's exciting. And there are other people over there too. The Twenty First Century Learning guys are doing more work. So, Ed Tech Talk is coming alive again, which is always exciting to see. Um, but I see it all over the place. There's it's so many places that are popping up. It's it's great. Um, but we uh, started here at edtechtalk.com, um, and uh, which is a channel of the World Bridges Network, um, and we're here every Wednesday evening. So thank you at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Thank you all, and we'll talk to you soon. Good night. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Paul. Okay, bye.